Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Extreme Desert Challenge. In the last episode, we adopted four dogs, one husky and three Labrador retrievers. We also hunted some elephants and overall stabilized our food production. Now, as we get going today, you can already see I have been planning a bit in between episodes, because that hydroponics area in the south of our base, yep, yeah, that is going to be a little bit larger in the future. Now, of course, we will need a ton of materials, most importantly steel, to make these plans a reality, but down the line we have room here for a total of 38 hydroponics basins, as well as 4 wind turbines and 4 solar panels. All in all, that should be a very good food and energy production area, especially if we also consider that eventually we will be able to build a geothermal generator just a few tiles further south. Now, we're starting things off today with the construction, or rather, replacement of a few doors. Most importantly, and this was also suggested in the comments of the last episode, a small doorway directly connecting our kitchen to our rice fields. And yes, I know, all that foot traffic is going to make our kitchen a little bit more dirty, but with our dogs eventually taking over most of the hauling work, we should have some capacity left for cleaning. So, at the moment, I'm not too worried about this. By the way, just for the purposes of this episode, I have also installed the Minify Everything mod, which basically lets you move around every single structure in the game, including, for example, solar panels. Over the course of this episode, we will use this mod to make our southern farming area look a little bit more organized. At the moment, it looks very thrown together, but that is how it grew organically. But this will allow us to make things look a little bit more pleasing on the eye. Now, with Red Hawk fully rested, we will also begin this episode with a brief caravan trip, because our storage room is slowly starting to get cluttered with more or less worthless weaponry. Weapons that we can't smell down because they're all made out of wood, so the next best thing, I suppose, would be selling them. We will likely not get a whole lot of silver for them, but maybe enough to purchase a few more units of meat, which we will need to make more kibble, because our dogs unfortunately can't eat raw hay. Back in the base, we will also be putting up a second research bench, because next to Troy we also have Stake, who is a very capable researcher, and who, for the last few days, has not been terribly busy. With his primary work type being construction, he has much less of a continuous occupation, if you will, and especially now that we also no longer need him to take care of as many hauling jobs, I think having him help out with research is a sensible idea. Now, having a second research bench will not allow us to research two projects simultaneously, but it will still significantly speed up the process of the one that we're currently working on, and that might even be necessary since we want to get all the way to gun turrets in this episode. First of all, though, we will now begin the reshuffling of our hydroponics basins. In the end, I would like to look at a much more symmetrical layout here. Again, at the moment, things are looking just a little bit rough. Shortly after then, Red Hawk also arrives at her destination with our good friends of the Black Trosca tribe, and so she can now do a bit of trading. For our weapons, we unfortunately only get 55 silver, but that is still enough to purchase 19 units of meat in return, meat that we will then be using to make more kibble for our dogs. Eventually, though, I think a more steady, self-sustainable meat supply would be the way to go, or alternatively, since kibble can actually also be made with other animal products like milk or eggs, a sizable population of efficient milk-giving or egg-laying animals might also be a possibility. Now, speaking of animals, next to Husky Natalie, Labrador Noosa has now also been trained in the art of hauling, and it doesn't take long until Troy has achieved the same for all of them. So not only do we now have four dogs who can now carry a lot of stuff for us, but Troy can also focus again on his research efforts. And in the evening, it is then finally time, gunsmithing has successfully been researched, and we can now craft ourselves a few more weapons. That is, however, only part of the reason we picked this project. Like I said earlier, our main motivation is to unlock gun turrets, but for that we need to research blowback operation first, so let's get on that. Just in that moment, Red Hawk also returns to the colony with the few units of meat she purchased, and meat is what we're going to have even more of in just a moment, because Troy is now going around slaughtering all of our ducks. I know we just bought the last one in the previous episode, but over the last few days I have been thinking, I have made some calculations, and really, if we just keep the ducks for their eggs, 
than nutrition-wise that is a very inefficient process. Chickens or geese, for example, would be much better suited for that, as both animals lay eggs much faster. So Dora, Pyroka, Swaggerbuns, Jesse and Sputnik, thank you for your service. The colony has decided it no longer needs you. But in earlier days, when food was scarce, your services were much appreciated. These days, however, the steakhouse has moved on and our Labradors are currently hauling steel for us. While back in the base, Admo has already had his brief round of sleep and is now doing some butchering work. To eventually turn the meat into kibble, we will wait until the hay is ready to be harvested. Yes, we do still have a surplus of both potatoes and rice as well, but in my opinion, whatever can be eaten by humans should be eaten by humans. So for the next few days, we will simply store the meat in our freezer. Outside of the base, our hydroponics farm is now finally also looking the way it should, but again, this is only the beginning. Down the line, this whole setup will likely expand significantly. Now, the remainder of the day is pretty uneventful. At night then, yet another thunderstorm rolls around, but our colonists are sleeping safe and sound, except for our fast sleeper Admo, who is currently in the process of putting up even more hydroponics basins. This time, however, we will not be planting more rice, but instead heel root, simply because I feel like we are already producing more food than we can eat, and because you can also never have enough medicine, and our current field is producing only at a very slow rate and will eventually get replaced, so all in all, I think it can't hurt to ramp up our production. Um, by the way, feel free to let me know what you think about the plans for this hydroponic setup. Do you think it makes sense? Do you think it's overkill? Should it maybe be placed in a different way? I have spent some time thinking about this, but maybe there are some aspects that I simply overlooked. So if you have any ideas or suggestions for improvements, then of course let me know. Our dogs, by the way, have hauled pretty much every steel slag chunk that could be found on the map, which means we now have plenty of smelting work to take care of. And that is a task that Redhawk and Edmo kind of share amongst each other. While one of them is smelting, the other one does the harvest and vice versa. Troy and Steak, meanwhile, are just focusing on research. And so the day passes by and we unfortunately do not quite get to the next research project. And there is also no more smelting to be done. So instead, let's get a hold of some more building materials. And you can already see it here. This is going to be a sizable task. Back in the base, meanwhile, research is progressing nicely, and so, a few hours later, our next project is completed. Blowback operation itself does not really unlock a whole lot of guns, but it now paves the way for gun turrets, which is what we will work on next. In the meantime, up north, our deconstruction efforts continue, and while we're on the topic of acquiring building materials, please also let me know which room or facility you think we are still missing, because I would really like to feature a bit more building. At the moment, however, I don't really think the colony desperately needs anything. But we could, for example, start working on a proper hospital. With our colony wealth increasing and rates getting stronger, that might be a sensible idea. Now, as you can see, it is finally time for the hay grass harvest, and in total, this small field alone here is already good for over 400 units of hay. That is, of course, much more than we have meat for, so an efficient hay grazing animal like cows or chickens, that would be interesting. Worst case scenario, we will simply trade it away. For the moment, Edmo can improve his already substantial plant skill further by sowing out new plants, and then he can start the kibble production. A little later that day, Edmo also throws a party. I'm not quite sure what the occasion is, but we won't judge. Let's have our colonists enjoy a moment of exuberance and community. They have most definitely earned it, I think. Now, one small negative side effect is that our colonists are consuming a ton of meals while they're having their party. Not that we don't have enough rice and potatoes to make more, but it's definitely not the most economical way of spending their time. After a few hours, the party then comes to an end and food production and research continue, and eventually night sets across the desert and we can skip ahead to the next morning. Well, morning is of course a subjective term, it is barely 2am, and we are going on a small adventure. 
Now, you might remember back when we opened up this ancient danger up here, we found a couple of crypto sleep caskets and so far we have not opened them yet. So, with a shield belt and the cover of night, let's see what Edmo can find. Okay, so we have here a few bugs that should not be hostile if I'm not mistaken. More importantly though, we also have four people, three of them are downed and all of them are injured, so it doesn't look like they will be attacking. Now, that is already a big relief, but maybe there are some suitable candidates among them, and if not, then at least we will be getting our hands on some good equipment. Now, our first candidate here looks solid but not great, and since she is the only one still standing, we probably won't be able to rescue her anyway, so the only way to recruit her would be to capture her, and honestly, all things considered here, I don't think she's worth the trouble. Candidate number two, meanwhile, is an old woman, bad back included. Her stats and traits, however, look pretty good, and I could see her in a role very similar to Redhawks, as a versatile medic who otherwise spends most of the time on the fields and who can help out in many different areas around the colony. Now, from one old woman, we move over to the next with Maddie here, and once again, we are looking at a wide array of good skills. The traits are good as well, except for depressive. Health-wise, however, she comes with two addictions and a bad back, so compared to Rebecca, I would say she is the clear second option. This now brings us to our fourth and final candidate, who, for a start, has no permanent injuries, sicknesses or addictions, and who could actually be an interesting addition to the colony, filling the primary roles of fighter and animal handler. Now, admittedly, under our current circumstances, both of those are not full-time jobs, but at least he will be able to take a load off of Troy's shoulders, who can then perhaps find the time to once again do a bit of artwork here and there. That is, of course, if he's not researching. So, let's start things off here. This will be the first person we'll rescue, but we'll also try our luck with 73-year-old Rebecca. Who knows, maybe one of them ends up joining us. For the time being, Edmo's bedroom will have to be repurposed into a temporary hospital. And yes, I know, it's always poor Edmo who has to suffer. But we have a long day still ahead of us, so depending on what happens in the next few hours, he should be able to move back in in the evening. Now, as usual, Redhawk takes care of the wounded while Edmo grabs a hold of a flak vest. Eventually, that is something that I think all of our colonists should have. But as our most well-rounded fighter, Edmo is certainly a well-suited first candidate. Now, poor Maddie, meanwhile, will be left to her own fate. We will lighten her suffering a bit by taking all of her belongings with us, among which we not only have a pristine suit of marine armor, but also a wide array of drugs, which, of course, should be trade goods first and foremost. I don't think our colony is ready for that type of chaos just yet. And just in case it lightens your conscience and gives you peace of mind, the fourth survivor here doesn't seem to care about her companion either. After patching up her wounds, she is wandering straight off the map. And I really don't think you can blame us for not taking in everyone here. After all, the steakhouse is just a small colony. And as good as we want to be, even we have our limits. Now, for the moment, our two guests are taken care of. Both of them are resting and recovering. So let's wait and see if our kindness is eventually repaid once they make it back upon their feet. Just in case one of them joins us, we can also already start working on another duster. And even if both decide to leave, then having one in reserve sure can't hurt. Eventually, we will need to replace the ones our colonists are wearing anyway. So a bit of work here will pay off one way or another. Shortly after, Redhawk then also receives an inspiration, but one that I'm honestly not sure how to utilize. She is not really the one making items, art or furniture in the first place, and as you can see, her corresponding skills here are incredibly low, so maybe we'll just have to let this one pass. Now, a short while later, Edmo finishes his work on the Camelhine Duster, and unfortunately, it's only of poor quality. So, a good craftsman or woman, that would be something our colony still needs. Our two guests are sadly not really suitable for that role. But who knows, maybe we'll find someone else soon enough. Since it's getting late and Edmo will eventually want a place to sleep, we'll now also have Stay Construct another bed. That way, our two patients will now have to share a very cramped makeshift hospital. But I think that's still better than sleeping out in the open.
That decision is then also immediately punished as one of the two rescued colonists gets an infection. And we are not leaving anything to chance here. This is a job for high quality regular medicine. And while Red Hawk gets ready to take care of a patient, we also finish the research of gun turrets, which means we can finally build some additional defenses. Now, for the moment, our colony seems a little occupied and the day is also slowly winding down. But at least on the infection front, Red Hawk delivers a 100% tent quality, so this should not become a major problem. More news from the hospital then shortly after, and unfortunately not the good kind. Yes, Rebecca has recovered a bit, but instead of joining us, she has decided to leave. Well, it's a free country, or desert at least, so we're not going to stop her. We are even going to let her stay with us until she has fully healed. My only hope is that her companion makes a different choice. Now, at this point, pretty much everyone is asleep except for Steak, who can now go on a short hunting trip. As you remember, inside of the crypto sleep caskets there were some bugs, and as far as I can tell, most of those are actually still on the map. Now, unlike most other animals, they will actually only drop insect meat, which our colonists will find absolutely detestable, but our dogs, on the other hand, will not mind in the least, so using it to make more kibble would be the way to go. Now, unfortunately, the Mega Scarabs here are small targets and it's dark outside, so they're not too easy to hit. But then again, even with their hard shell, they are no match for bullets. So even though we will see the occasional Manhunter alert here, I don't think Steak is in any danger. Something you can also see here while we're doing all of this, I have also already marked the locations of all potential geothermal generators. I find that to be very helpful when planning how to extend the base further. And there are actually quite a few of these steam vents close by, so the final base should have no trouble harnessing the power of three, maybe even four of them. Now, after only a couple of hours of hunting, we now have four dead bugs. There might be a fifth one still running around somewhere, or it may have wandered off the map already. In any case, for the time being, I was not able to find it. So, the next morning is here and it is time to choose our next research project. And we are actually going with drug production. Maybe not the most obvious choice, but potentially a very good way to make some money, as drugs are lightweight yet expensive, and in most cases actually relatively easy to produce. The goal here would be to research Psychide Refining next, which would then allow us to make Flake and Yayo, drugs that can both be made only from Psychoid leaves, and growing those should not be too much of a problem. Now, just seconds after Troy actually sits down in front of the research bench, we have fantastic news. Because our rescuing efforts were actually successful, we have just gained ourselves another colonist. And to be honest, from the two we rescued, he was also my favorite. So uh, yeah, the number of men surrounding Red Hawk is only getting larger. Let's hope that this one does not follow in Atmos' footsteps. For the name, by the way, we are, of course, as always, going with the list of patrons in the naming rights tier and above. And colonist number five here will be named Jake, after patron Jake Pinner. And as I said earlier, his primary task will likely be that of an animal handler. But thanks to his jogger trait, he might actually also be a suitable candidate to wear some of the heavier armors in the game, as those normally come with a rather hefty movement speed penalty. A penalty that this trait can very easily counter. To get us started though, Jake can simply get himself dressed and also equip a machine pistol. And then it's back off to bat for him to make a full recovery. Edmo, meanwhile, can start butchering the bugs, which actually yields a good amount of meat per animal. However, it is unfortunately not possible to actually breed these. They sadly do not reproduce, which is a bit of a shame, I'd say, since they consume an incredibly low amount of food and would therefore make for an interesting meat animal, albeit one that is mostly only good for feeding other animals. Now, in the meantime, Steak has removed most of the floor tiles from what was once the ancient danger, and as a result, we now once again have plenty of steel. Additionally, Red Hawk has also been busy mining, so while our dogs are still hauling back some of those materials, we are already well prepared to build our first two turrets. Before we can talk more about the setup though, Steak coincidentally walks past the fifth Mega Scarab, so let's have him quickly shoot that down before we start constructing.
Now the idea here is pretty simple. We want turrets to face our base entrance and to take care of any enemies that make it through our traps. And yes, I am aware that having our main defenses so close by to our main food and energy production is not ideal. But trust me, I already have some plans for that. I just wanted to get something going before the end of today's episode. And at the moment, we unfortunately do not have the steel for a larger, more powerful turret setup. Now, since turrets are likely to be attacked by anything that attacks us, we will give them some sandbags as cover. And we're also putting a piece of granite wall between them, as turrets are prone to explode when they're too damaged. This way, we're simply making sure that one turret doesn't take the other one with it when it goes up in flames. But all in all, this is a very basic setup and again, far from ideal. But against only a couple of raiders or tribalists, it should get the job done. Now, before we can finish construction, Jake also has his first mental break. Somewhat understandable, I'd say, considering his current living situation and the injuries he suffered. And because we don't want him to damage too much of our base, we will simply have Red Hawk come over and capture him. To make that happen, our former hospital now needs to be turned back into a prison, and that also causes our other guest Rebecca to leave. But then again, that was apparently her plan all along. Our turret setup, meanwhile, is now mostly finished. The only thing that's still missing is a handy on and off switch. Otherwise, these turrets will consume power, even though 90% of the time they won't need it. With that in place, however, and our turrets now switched off for the time being, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut in today's episode. In my opinion, we have made some good progress. After only 22 episodes, we already have as many colonists as we had at the end of our Ice Sheet series. And to be honest, I think our colony can use a few more. So in more than just one way, the steakhouse will keep growing. For today though, let's wrap things up right here. As always, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.